Okay, Ingrid and Alexis, if you guys are ready, we can probably kick it off. Okay. Hi, hey, Alexis. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's it's surreal in Zoom because I'm still trying to wrap my head around. Like I can see that there are 76 participants, but I can't. <laughs> I don't get the energy of 76 participants. I'm just sitting in. Uh, I know it's LPA. it's odd, and we're also used to these big Zooms now too. That you know, here we are, just just the three of us in an intimate conversation. But I guess maybe that's the point. So. Well, this is, this is well, I'm, I'm, I'm just grateful to be here and, and thank you to everyone for joining. Um, thank you, Ingrid from ILH Possibilities. Um, yeah, thank you, Tucker, obviously from Log DNA. Yeah. Um, you know, DEI is something that our industry just has a lot of work to do on and, and it's something that's important because at the end of the day will mean greater companies and greater returns and, and just from a pure business standpoint is so important. Um, you know, Ingrid, you're, you're the expert here. Um, first, tell us about ILH possibilities and, um, and, and a little bit about your own background as well. Thank you. Uh, I just want to say it's an honor to sit with you too and have this really, I think, intimate conversation um, that everyone's going to get a chance to witness. Uh, so <laughs> I've been a diversity, equity, and inclusion or DEI consultant and strategist for about 20 years now um, as a practitioner, right? And so I launched my business a little over a year ago. Um, you know, what we do is we partner with small companies and large companies to just affect change and uh, you know create an inclusive work work environment you know what I what I often say is that um, I joyfully make space for everyone right we, we teach people how to go back to junior high school and you know scoot over on the lunch bench and let someone else sit down so that's a very like kind of colloquial way to say it but that's what we do uh -huh. And then, uh, you know, Tucker, what made you reach out to Ingrid and, and what's really informed your thinking about DEI? Yeah, like, so, the, I mean, there's, you know, there's obviously so much happening in the world right now that's put it front and center. So, you know, kind of with that backdrop, but um, I was super fortunate to have two really meaningful experiences kind of hit me at the same time. And so I've been CEO of LogDNA for just about three months now. And right when I was uh, starting that journey, I, uh, it happened to be the two of you that were these two big influences on me. So I, it's just really, so as Ingrid said, it's a, it's a huge honor to, to be here right now. But the, the first one that I'll share is, is uh, I saw your CBS interview and, uh, and it like, it brought out a lot of like white male realities for me too. And, and the two that, that I mentioned to you before that really jumped out to me were that, you know, that we be, were accepted by default and that's not the experience that, that everybody has. And the, and the other was, uh, or I think Serena had called you out on, was that uh, we come from a place of assuming people are listening, right? Mm -hmm. And and that's like, that that just really struck me because I do make that assumption. I have had that assumption through my life and through my career. And to, to just to recognize that other people aren't having that, um, it was super meaningful to me to, um, to have that influence. So thank you for that. Uh, the other was, I, I happened to join an allyship webinar that Ingrid was putting on, and I didn't even know what allyship was. I had never heard of it before. But I joined this webinar and what like a transformative experience for me and, and two things that, that really struck me from her were, were the first was that as an ally, you don't get to decide how you show up. You decide that you want to show up, but you don't get to decide how you do it. Um, and I think that's super important. And the other was that you should focus on changing what you can change. You know, as, as we look at kind of the broad uh, scope of the world right now. You, you, no individual can take on the entire problem. So it's super important that we make change in the places we can. So, so like, so what's really for me is I, is I took a step back with those influences and I looked at all the benefits I'd received through my career for, through incredible mentors and, and uh, coworkers I've had along the way. And as I was stepping into my first CEO role, I realized that I, I needed to start by doing everything I can to set the, to set the right example and to be the best leader I can. And, and DEI is, is front and center on that for me. Love it. I, I mean, I, yeah, that's, um, I think the, we do have a responsibility for sure. And um, I feel like I um, was lucky to, I, I've been very fortunate to hear a lot of feedback, like what you just said. And um, it makes me feel like, you know, taking that first step at least of um, 
you know, leaving the red board and, and protest there was, was a good one, an important one, and, and, and just the start. Um, but, you know, this is, uh, this is a conversation that I know a lot of people have been talking about for a long time, um, but not enough people have been mm-hmm. talking about it, mm-hmm. especially tech. Um, you know, Ingrid, you're, you're, you've obviously been, been thinking about this quite a bit. Um, you know, wh- there's, there's a lot of challenges in this industry, but w- what are the ones that are top of mind for you right now that leaders who are watching this uh, can be thinking about and, and aware of? Yeah, so I, you know, I just want to kind of tag on to what uh, Tucker said about your CBS interview. I immediately, as a black woman, it resounded with me immediately. You know, I was like, this is more than admirable for his family. This ha- is going to have a, a ripple effect, right? And so, you know, as Tucker said, it was it was very salient in the reasons that he thinks about leading differently. So because Tucker saw that interview and because he sat with me in an allyship um, webinar, it's been a little easy to work with Tucker. <laughs> Let's just put it like that. He's a great student. I, 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 he really allows me to lead. So what's important for me um, in general is, you know, if you don't know how to get started, is to find someone to help guide you, right? Like, I think that's important. If you don't know, you don't know. And And so, you know, anyone's lived experience or worked experience is important. When I think about big tech, though, and, you know, what's happened since 2014, when they start releasing, you know, the diversity reports, you know, incremental changes have been made, right? You know, still 32% women in, you know, the the top 10 big tech companies and 8% Latinx and 7% um, black and uh, 0.5% indigenous peoples, right? Um, And then even of those 32%, many of those are white women, right? So there's still a, 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 a reality that we have to bring BIPOC Uh, black, indigenous, I always forget people don't understand my terminology, people of color, (laughs) right, right, Um, into the conversation, you know, it's great to throw money out and it's great to make statements, right, Um, but, you know, even groups like Color of Change are running, um, are, are running campaigns against companies that it's called behind the statement, right, and so it's like you're saying that Black Lives Matter, but are you creating economic mobility for your black employees? And is there promotability within your organization, right? Like what do you, what type of, um, in, what types of resources are you committing to that, right? So for me, it is committing the resources um, and it's getting started. You know, I love working with these guys because they are a startup, but at the end of the day, when you weave this stuff into the fabric of your company from the beginning, Like you can't go wrong with it. And then additionally, I think about like how even with C-suite employees, right? Like, you know, Tucker and I have this conversation often about like, you know, this leading from um, the example, you know, is, is really important because when people of color look up and they see people that look like them, they know that they can promote and grow in the company as well. Right. Mm -hmm. But I also know that the resources are limited. Right. So when we try to source outside, right. Of the company, it's hard because, you know, BIPOC people are just not in those C-suites as it is right now. So we have to begin to grow them. So mm-hmm. I look at the resources, right? I think it's really important to commit the resources and the time. It's not going to happen in a year. It's probably going to take about five years to really see the, um, the importance of it. Um, and then I think growing pipeline programs with children, right? Like mm-hmm. starting in the elementary school level. Yeah right? And introducing um, technology to them at a very early age is important as well. Hmm. And, and, you know, what is, what is the trap that you're seeing companies fall into, you know, overall the industry, you name the statistics, right? There's still, I don't think anyone can feel um, proud of that, Mm -hmm. but what is the trap a company can fall into that has been, thinking about themselves as being a part of the solution that actually does, you know, relative to their peers measure up pretty well. Um, What are the blind spots you're seeing for the folks who feel like they're doing a pretty good job? 
I think not intentionally focusing on certain populations and demographics, right? Because if you were to look at tech, you wouldn't just typically say, well, it's not a diverse industry, right? Even from the API diaspora, you've, you know, there's so much represented there, right? And Asia so, Pacific Asia, Islander. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I had to be sure. I was not sure. No, absolutely. But you have a lot represented there, but it doesn't represent everyone, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I think that we always have to get, we talk about this all the time, being comfortable with being uncomfortable. And then the minute that we get comfortable again, we have to get uncomfortable. Because the minute that we feel comfortable, we're missing a population in our workforce. And so what are we going to go do? What are we going to do to go find that particular demographic? I think we get comfortable, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. and I think uh, go ahead, I'm practically, sorry. yeah, oh no, sorry. But, but I think practically, when you mentioned traps, Alexis, I, I think that's a really good, mm -hmm. good term. Um, and I, we've been thinking a lot about that a lot of DNA and, and what traps we're falling into. And, and two that really jumped out, have jumped out to me, uh, you know, through the process has been, uh, you know, through this kind of discovery process and learning and guiding we get from Ingrid is is the first is i think we often use speed as an excuse right so mm -hmm. and like at the end of the day that's bullshit like we we talk about speed and the pressure to hire but the majority of that is self-imposed and the time it takes to 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 reach into your network to to network more uh, effectively into these communities and to set up a diverse interview panel and to make sure you're doing things correctly it doesn't actually take that much time it takes some time to set it up but it doesn't mm -hmm. it's 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 kind of like a red herring of sorts where where mm -hmm. like you truly can run these these you know, like truly kind of inclusive interview panels and uh, and searches and and speed won't be impacted if it is impacted it's like impacted by a couple of weeks but we're not in top talking about months or years right mm -hmm. and then the other I've I've found myself falling into and we we did an unconscious bias training recently internally and the whole the whole concept that we have this intention of uh, you know trying to bring in a more diverse um, set of employees. Um, but but then we use experience as a criteria, right? And you think about that logically, it doesn't make any sense. Like you want to get underrepresented people, but then you're requiring experience as a criteria. So kind of through that training, we we started to change how we think about that interview process. And we interview now more based on scenarios versus experience. And that, that allows us to open up to capability versus, you know, did you have the opportunity before? Mm. Well, and you're also coming into this role as a new CEO. I mean, yep. we're, we're fortunate to have um, my partner, Gary, uh, from the very early days, led that deal in log DNA for initialized years ago. So we, we you know, mm -hmm. we've been close to y'all's firm from the very beginning. Um, and, and it's a company that has just steadily grown and grown and grown and grown. And now you're entering this role as a new CEO. Did you see it as an opportunity to, to re-examine things like, you know, any kind of transition in a company culture that comes from transitions in leadership, or rather I should say those transitions in leadership do present opportunities for sort of re-examining just things, right? It's just it's yeah. fresh set of eyes. Um, are there things you think that companies can do short of, you know, having, having new folks take new leadership roles um, to create that same kind of effect yeah, I know. I think so. Like, it's so coming into the new CEO role, like, so, you know, it's really interesting because I, that happened, you know, in the middle of a pandemic with racial, you know, racial reckoning and my first CEO job. So that, you know, that's a, that's an interesting Probably. spot to be in in life. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, but, but like, why, you know, like, let's, let's, what a great time to do it right. You know? Mm -hmm. And, uh, and it, what's interesting about that too is, you know, Chris, who, you know, who, who was a founder and CEO is like the, one of the most caring, thoughtful, kind Absolutely. people in the world. And he shares my perspective on everything that I'll say, that I'll share today. So, mm -hmm. so I really am representing he and myself in this, but, um, but, you know, but we we looked at it together and we really said like, this is the, this is the intention versus action problem, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's easy to, on some level to have an intention, but if you want to have action and you want that action to grow and scale with your company, you have to make some, you have to make change. And so as, as Chris and I and, and Amy, who runs uh, H, HR and people at, at LogDNA looked at it, we said that the, there's really two areas that we need to focus and, and it can be pretty practical, right? It doesn't have to be this like massive systemic change. It can be very practical steps that fit into your flow of business. And so we focused on uh, talent acquisition and recruitment, uh, which includes, you know, expanding our networks, right? So we talk a lot about the speed, the speed trap. 
And we know we're going to have critical business hires down the road. So we should invest in our networks now so that the point of need, we're ready to go. Like we've mm -hmm. got that, that investment in the network. Uh, and then there's also training, employee engagement. So, so, so those, those are kind of the broad categories of things we've done. But, but, then, but then like on the practical sense, as I, as I mentioned before, it's like simply putting diversity in the panel of interviews. It's, it's something as simple as uh, interviewing for scenario versus experience could be another really practical step, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we've also established ERGs, which is employee resource groups internally for employees to come together to represent um, you know, different underrepresented groups and, and be a conduit for growth for those employees to be a conduit for awareness uh, within the company as well. So those are, those are pretty practical. Um, they didn't, they're not like, we didn't have to shut down operations to do them. We were able to, you know, keep things moving, but do it with, you know, with actions that meet intention. Hmm. And, you know, this is, these are some very good specific examples. And then, you know, Ingrid, with your view on this, talking to so many different companies, um, how, how do you make sure to build an organization that provides that, basic sort of physiological safety for BIPOC folks um, that, that you want to bring in and, and not just, right, it, it's not just about uh, diversity, it's about the inclusion work. Um, talk, talk about how to create that and how to, how to build that foundation for folks. Yeah, that's, it, it's so important, right? You know, we are just in a time where there's not a lot of trust in our world right now. And so, um, you know, we take that to work with us, unfortunately, right? And, and for good reason. Um, so you gotta start by listening, right? Like you gotta start by building the empathy that you need to for your employees, right? And so sometimes it's just, I do a lot of listening sessions for companies, right? Like not the listening session where people come in and just kind of riff and, and, and vet, vent about what's what they're upset about but we really look at it from outcomes right so you know the expectation that we set is we're going to come in we're going to ask you what's going on with you and then from that we're going to build a list of intentions that we're actually going to act on right um, there's something about being heard then there's something about being heard at the company level and then being heard from your supervisor, right? And so I think it's extremely important for managers as managers of people that we set that time aside to say, how are you doing? You know, um, I know that you, you know, especially for black employees, I've been talking to a lot of black employee groups over the past five months. And there's just this another level of, of hurt and despair that that we as people are carrying right now and so just the acknowledgement that things might be a little different for me today i may feel a little different it makes me feel as though you care and it creates that um opportunity to create an inclusive environment right and an environment of belonging and then finally i would say you know just being able to allow not just folks to vent but actually participate in the solution solving the solving of things right so it doesn't mean that we were necessarily going to go to our BIPOC employees and we're going to say hey can you help us fix this but we're going to say hey listen we want to be allies and we need to know how you need us to show up right creating a space what I found as well is this tremendous um, environment for people that really are they're carrying a lot of guilt for many reasons but sometimes they just want to do the right thing it doesn't matter if you want to show up for me that makes me feel good, but I need you to show up in the way that I need you to show up, right? So I do a lot of allyship seminars because sometimes, as Tucker said earlier, um, you know, allyship is never self-defined. You know, you need to make sure that the person that you're seeking to align with actually needs your help or needs whatever you're trying to offer them, right? And then the mm -hmm. final piece is what Tucker said, uh, really low hanging fruit for us was employee resource groups. They create safe spaces, right? They, they create an opportunity to educate um, you know, other communities in the workforce on what that particular affinity kind of thinks about. But it's not, it, and, and as much as we have a, you don't have to be to belong mentality, meaning you don't have to be a woman to come to the women in tech group, but we definitely want to create a safe space for those women as well, right? So we want to invite you in. We want to invite men in. We need the allyship, but we don't always need you in our space, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and so what are the things that, or how should leaders anticipate then a response 
from uh, uh, like let's say let's say white employees who feel like this is it's causing them to have to you know walk on eggshells or you talked about getting comfortable with the uncomfortable I mean being uncomfortable is by definition not comfortable so how how should leaders approach handling this you know especially where a majority of the workplaces in tech are majority white um, what's the way for leaders to to sort of tell that story that that also doesn't sabotage the actual goals here assuming that they really want to create a diverse and inclusive workplace well i actually could toss this to tucker because i think he's done a great job but what i will say is i think having tucker's mindset one of the so I, I, I don't work with everyone. I don't, I am selective. And one of the things that Tucker said to me that I really appreciated in our very first conversation, he said, Ingrid, I am, I am privileged. Like I check off every box of privilege and I know that it's not okay, right? So he had an empathy and a desire to acknowledge what he walks in every day and to use that privilege to that privilege to stand in the gap, right? And to try to bring others along with him. I think if you're leading as a leader, you have to be willing to do that. Everyone's not going to. I believe that the companies that don't lean into that in this season, because this is the perfect season to lean into it, there's so many resources and there's so much camaraderie in it, right? If you mm -hmm. don't lean into it in this season, I think you're going to miss it. I think folks are going to miss it, right? Mm -hmm. And so having someone be able to come and again, whether you know, it's myself or hiring a permanent DEI person on staff that you will actually allow to lead you, right? So I hate to say this, but there's a lot of companies out here with optical allyship, right? So they'll hire um, a diversity, equity, and inclusion person at the director level with two and three levels above them, right? So very little gets done because mm -hmm. that person, okay. unlike me, you know, Tucker allows me to chop in the throat <laughs> and then get a big hug. It's true. I love that. Yeah. It's true. Yeah, it's true. I take my beatings though. I, I, I think that as Ingrid's alluding to, for, for me in, in this, it was, uh, it really starts with a safe environment. I think all of the, the you change your website, change your interviewing process, put the, do the trainings, you know, do all the things, right? But like, if you're not creating a safe environment, then it's, then it is that eggshell, it is optical DEI, right? Mm -hmm. and, and so my goal was to make it something that was like deep and ingrained in the company. But in order to do that, you have to take this incredibly uncomfortable topic and make it comfortable for people to talk about. And, and, and the uncomfort is more that again, intentions and actions, but it's not that it's uncomfortable in and of itself, but, but people don't want to get it wrong. You know, I think there's this, mm -hmm. there's this um, sense of like, I don't want to say the wrong thing. I don't want to do the wrong thing. And you start to feel, you know, different versions of shame or guilt and things like that when you go through it. But for, so for me, I, I started with wanting to create a safe environment around it. But that meant starting by being vulnerable in the discussion, mm -hmm. like being willing to be wrong and like coming with a desire to learn, not with a desire to be right. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so it kind of implied as that is, is you have to be comfortable being wrong. You have to admit when you're wrong too. Like there's myself included, a number of us who have uh, said the wrong thing or made the wrong statement or took the wrong action. And we're trying to create a culture of, of mutual accountability, right? So that we can call mm -hmm. each other out and that, and that calling out doesn't mean like shame on you, but it means like, hey, we're all here to get better and, and, and we want to, and that's something we really want to do. And the other thing that was interesting for me with all this desire to create this safe environment, I, I realized in this process over the last two to three months that I don't get to decide when that happens. Like I want to decide when that happens. I want to say, hey, it's safe. And, and, and then all of a sudden, magically it's safe. But I don't, I, that's not for me to decide. It's for me to it's for me to want and desire. It's for me to push through when I, if I do it wrong, it's for me to set a good example, but ultimately it's the people that, that are the employees of the company that get to decide when safety exists. And so we, we had this really, I hope the people of Logging A don't mind me describing this. We had this really meaningful and it's, it's small, but, but sometimes meaning comes out of really small things. We did this unconscious bias training as a company. And so we're all on zoom. There's, you know, 110 of us on zoom. And you have a little chat room on the side. And, and so we were going through that. And, and all of a sudden, in, in we've, had, we've done other trainings and it was pretty quiet. Then all of a sudden in this chat room on the side, we were talking about different, different uh, aspects of unconscious bias. Someone chimed in and shared that, hey, you know, that the company's been pronouncing uh, their name wrong. 
for for some period of time. Wow. <laughs> and what like what 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 a what a like a courageous thing to do to go put that yeah. in there and to yeah. take advantage of that opportunity. But then from there, like I, I think it was like 30, but I've been corrected that maybe it was closer to 15 or 17 people came in with these different experiences about how they had their given name because as immigrants to the country, their parents didn't want them to feel different mm-hmm. or that no one ever pronounces their name right. So they just changed their name, right? Mm-hmm. And it, it's, not, it's not exactly DEI, but it, it, has, it has this like deep, like a name is a deep, deeply personal thing. Yeah. And to have people changing, <laughs> altering, getting their name, like all that stuff is like crazy. But, but all of a sudden I wasn't involved. I'm like pretty much ever can, you know, pronounce Tucker and <laughs> like, like it's not a deal, you know? So, but I'm just watching this unfold, this, this kind of safe space unfold at a point in time when I didn't even expect it. And, mm. and I just think that like, that was such a meaningful learning experience for me to say, like, I was proud on one hand that like we continue to push through and try to create those safe spaces but humbled to know that like, I'm, I don't have any control of it. All I can do is the best I can to facilitate. And it's when the people feel that way, that it actually is true. And I think, I think it's that level of safety and that level of vulnerability combined with, combined with those programs you put in place that will actually make it real. Mm-hmm. I just want to, I want to add on to that. We had another conversation yesterday. We were in another meeting and that story came up. And so I don't, I'm sure you may know this, maybe you don't, because that situation came up with that person's name, there was somebody in this meeting that was like, hey, you know what we're trying to do? We're actually trying to create a space um, in your contact information for the company that tells you how to pronounce your name, right? Mm-hmm. So, and it's not just for that particular employee, it would be mm-hmm. for every employee. Yeah. Well, that's, that's what I'm talking about though. That's the inclusion piece, right? Mm-hmm. And that's the belonging yeah. piece, right? Little things like that. Those are the ripples that create the ripple effect. That's very, very smart. And, and it's interesting. I'm even thinking about uh, a CRM that I'm building, um, <laughs> that I'm building right now. And I'm like, God, I need to add that section for um, pronunciation just beneath uh, the first name, last name. Yeah, that's subtle things like that start to really add up and make a difference. And, and, it, and it's meaningful. And I think, um, I, I appreciate you all saying this and talking about it so openly because I, I do think I have um, I have a great advantage not not just because you know I I've got a front row seat to to greatness in my wife but but because you know Tucker you talked about um, there is this uh, sort of obligation that we have with our privilege to go into these situations expecting to get uncomfortable expecting to learn and to not have the outcome be wanting to be right and as a person that is a hard thing for me because i go into a lot of conversations wanting to be right or at least to seek truth and to seek a truth that sort of makes sense to me and i think one of the great advantages I've had being in a relationship with and now married to a a black woman is that our foundation of those discussions is based on love, which is one, you know, you shouldn't have with all of your employees. Um, (laughs) But like I have, I have this huge advantage of a kind of default steady state security, which is this person, no matter how uncomfortable conversation gets like, cares deeply about me i care deeply about her and when it gets to the because like i'll hit those guardrails where i'm just like not i i'm there's just a disconnect where i'm not understanding i'm not able to really empathize beyond a certain point by my own limitations and um and i've really had to learn and i still work at getting out of the mode of trying to not just be right but even try to just to, to feel that moment of defensiveness mm-hmm. and to, to acknowledge it and be like, yo, I'm getting, I'm, I'm getting defensive right now uh, because it's, it's, hit, it's touching on these nerves that I know make me feel bad because I, I have this expectation of myself being a, you know, not racist, not sexist person. Mm-hmm. Uh, like I think, a lot of, I think a lot of people in our situation are, are genuinely good people who are trying to do right, but we still mess up. 
And, yep. and the idea is not this binary thing. It's this idea of, of spending the rest of our lives just trying to be less racist, frankly. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so I've always felt like it's a huge advantage. And so I'm not saying, I mean, it, it's, I, I, and so I have an extra amount of respect for the guys in my position who are, are able to get into these conversations or at least able and, and looking to create these environments where they work. Um, because I know it is, it is that important work that actually starts to move things forward. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I just wonder, you know, um, you know, and, and for both of you all, you know, this has been a traumatic year. I don't even, it's not even over yet. I don't even know what, no, I'm not even gonna try to predict what's gonna happen next month or next year. Um, but what are things you all are doing at Log DNA, and then what are things you all are seeing or you're seeing Ingrid across sort of the industry and clients and whatnot that people are doing to try to almost future proof to, to where, where things are going because um, I don't know, we're, you know, when we talk about, when we talk about building a sustainable business, you know, part of the job is thinking around the corner to next year and, and what you want to do product wise or revenue wise or anticipating things. But how are smart organizations thinking about it from a DEI standpoint? Yeah. So, like, Trucker, did you want to try? No, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah. I'll take the DEI stuff, right? Okay. Yeah. No, just uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, see, Tucker, you were supposed to jump you take in. Take the hard ones. You no. Take the hard ones. <laughs> <laughs> the hard ones. Okay. Uh, so, well, look, I'm just going to take, take notes. That's a good question, Alexis. I'm oh, no, 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 no. Look, look, look. So, so here, here's the thing. Um, Unfortunately, diversity, equity, and inclusion have always been on the back burner that, you know, any division, I used to work in corporate diversity, equity, and inclusion for a Fortune 50 company for many, many years, and it's a non-revenue generating division, right? Um, it has been seen for a long time uh, kind of in tandem with HR and not ingrained in human resources, right? And so it's like, oh, it's that thing over there. And so many times when we talk about DEI, it becomes reactive, right? It's like, why? Because we haven't until now been willing to have tough conversations, right? Mm -hmm. And so what I've seen is like literally me sitting on a Zoom like, all right, I need a yes. I need a yes to be able to send this communication. I need a yes. I need a project plan for you, right? Mm -hmm. Like I need to really sit down and understand percentage wise, like Tucker and I have talked about some percentages and just, mm -hmm. you know, I, I need some hard metrics that you're willing to commit to because here's the thing you have to understand, as I said earlier, it's not a sprint. It's a race, right? And it's a long one. And we're just beginning the race. So what the smart companies are doing is again, they're bringing folks in that they're allowing to sit with them and challenge their assumptions but allowing them to help make the, oh my gosh, I wish I could tell you how hard it is to sit in a role where you are seen as the diversity, equity, and inclusion person and the person who should be able to shift the paradigm, but you don't have the power to because everyone is not bought into it, right? And so the companies that are making the best and the most impact are the companies that are stakeholdering the folks that make those decisions. Right. And I don't even think we can obviously think that, oh, well, if you've got people of color, you know, seated in C-suite roles, they're going to be down with it as well, because it's not necessarily the same. We've unfortunately been indoctrinated into a system that is systematically wrong for people of color. Right. It just doesn't fit us. And we assimilate all the time. Right. We assimilate. We, we ingrain ourselves into a culture um, that we're happy to be a part of right? But it doesn't really consider us. So now what I'm hearing is people really building out that diversity, having everyone there, inclusion, inviting people to dance, and then belonging. I'm allowed to dance any way I want, and no one's going to make fun of me, right? And, and my opinions, and I can show up as a cultural ad, and I'm not looked to be a cultural fit, right? That's another way we hmm. kind of discriminate as we say, oh, I don't know if this person's a cultural fit. Hmm. What does that really mean, right? What does that really mean? So, you know, I'm a, I, I worked in uh, digital distribution for a while and I was the only woman on a team of nine white men, five, nine, everyone else was five, eight, 
it was hard for me to wear heels. Don't let me wear red lipstick. Then I was getting Beyonce comments. I was a single mom. No one else had kids. Like, so I was like in this really tech environment where I was standing out like a sore thumb and I never felt like I belonged, but I made space for myself, right? And so everyone's not like me, right? Everybody's not gonna come in and make space. So the companies that are doing it best are the companies that are doing just what I said before. They're scooting over or they're doing what you did, Alexis, and they're mm -hmm. saying, I'm not even gonna scoot over. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna leave. I'm gonna let you sit at the table, right? Mm -hmm. That's what needs to be done. More mm -hmm. of that. Mm -hmm. Well, I think there's, there are reasons to be hopeful right now, I hope, or at least I'm, I'm feeling some, I, you know, I'm speaking to enough CEOs, I've had enough folks talking about the commitments they're making and then actually follow through with it. And I mean, Tucker, you've, you've been walking the talk for sure. Um, are there things that, I don't know, that, that just are the sort of most glaring things that either have to go or, or are there, are there things that we should just no longer that we should, you know, okay. You know, if there was a CEO recently of a bank, I'm going to Google it to make well, sure. Well. Thank you. And what was his comment exactly about the pipeline or there's not enough yeah, talent? He, yeah. He said he can't find any black uh, employee pretty much. I'm, I'm going to, I'm a paraphrase this, but that there no. was no one, he couldn't find any senior level black people in banking in the finance industry to promote and uh, create more opportunities for. Yes, a very limited pool of black talent to recruit from. Sorry, CNN autoplay. Um, but okay, like, is that like, this is, can we, can we just throw this one in the dumpster as a quote that just needs to just go away? Um, is there anything to be learned from this? Like what, what does this tell us about? I mean, the CEO of Wells Fargo should know better. Um, but where, where are the failures there? How, how, how deep does this go? I don't think, I think he thought he was okay saying what he said. Mm -hmm. I think that's the problem, right? Like to your point, you have a front row seat to this. Mm -hmm. Tucker has somewhat of a front row seat working with me. Right, like so, it's 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 proximity, right? Sometimes, yeah. um, mm -hmm. and again, he may have had uh, a few black employees working under him, right? He may have mm -hmm. had that, but they were the select few, right? And mm -hmm. so, obviously, he doesn't believe that there are more. So, you got to we got we have to start challenging those assumptions, right? So, I love that he said what he said. You know why? Because it brought it out into the open. Thank God, right? Thank God. Do, 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 do you see it as a difference between? Nope, we got a lot of feedback there. Do you see it as a difference between um, equality and equity too? In some ways, like I think I, when I think about the pipeline comments, I always feel like there's this sense that like whoever comes through, we're going to give a fair shake to, right? We're going to run an inclusive process. We're going to balance that out, right? And it was re it was recently. I mean, I, I'm learning on the fly here, right? So it was like maybe two or three weeks ago, or maybe one or two. I, I learned the difference between equality and equity, right? And and then the the concept is that essentially that like, you know, equality is everyone gets treated fairly, and, and equity is that you lift those up who need it so that they have a, a fair opportunity, right? If I if I got that directionally correct, but but yeah. when I think about the the pipeline. Um, commentary. I always feel like that's an equality statement versus an equity statement because again you say like well I don't whoever comes through I'm gonna treat them inclusively but if you think about it from an equity standpoint you're saying I'm gonna reach deeper into the network I'm gonna bring people up I'm gonna create training programs I'm gonna get more people in the industry I'm gonna lift up high potential managers I'm gonna give people opportunities based on their aptitude and capabilities and not their experience and that, that feels more like the equity mindset and I, I feel like that's where uh, a lot of us need to get more comfortable going is that the equity is required, not just equality in this case. Yeah, and, and I think we, I think most industries are based on like this whole system of meritocracy, right? It's just what you mm -hmm. said, Tucker. It's like whoever's there gets the chance, but if you mm -hmm. never get there, right? So even mm -hmm. if you, I, I had a friend that worked in finance for a company which shall not be named, but they had a, a they decided that they needed to create more opportunities for black um, associates in their finance firm. And so they hired 10 folks and they took them through a whole year program, but those were the last people hired. Mm 
So as soon as the layoffs came, guess who went? Mm -hmm. Right? So yeah. we have to look at it because mm -hmm. sometimes you actually do have to say, I'm sorry. I understand they're the last ones here, but we cannot do this because to your point, Tucker, that's where the equity piece comes in, right? We have to hold on to at least five of these people. Like we, we brought them in with this amazing opportunity. And then as soon as the money goes, we say, you know what? You weren't important enough to keep. So it sends a much larger message and it creates a bigger problem, right? So yeah, equity is huge. The other thing I would say too is just the econ economic mobility piece, right? So that is understanding that when someone comes in the door and although they're a coordinator or an, a, a, a secretary even, um, or an assistant. I, I don't even know if that was politically correct to call somebody a secretary now. That's how old I am. Anyway, <laughs> they're an assistant, right? And they come in the door, but they have a desire to grow in your particular business, acknowledging that from the onset and not keeping them stuck in the assistant role, right? Like creating the, the opportunity for them to grow within the company so that they can sustain and take care of their families, right? And that they don't have to leave you right, with this wealth of knowledge that, they, that they've now gained from you. So mm -hmm. we have to hit it from so many different angles, but I think the conversations that we're having today are the conversations that need to be had. To just start, mm -hmm. we have to start. Hmm. Well, I, I think, I, and I trust that this conversation we're having here is gonna start more conversations. Um, Tucker, I know you've got some parting words for folks, and I would love just to, to, to shamelessly as well talk about some of the exciting things you all are building at LogDNA and, and why this is all just so important for you. There, yeah. there are lots of things you all could be focusing time on, but you know that this is important. You've demonstrated uh, a willingness uh, to, to grow and, and show, you know, hopefully others how you're doing it and, and how, how we can all be better. Yeah, we, look, our, our goals today were, were, were twofold. One is to, one was to kind of facilitate a vulnerable conversation and hopes that, as you mentioned, hopes that that stimulates more. Um, it wasn't to say that we're doing it right or we're doing it perfectly, but to share our experiences and if people can take away something practical or people come, come away uh, knowing that there's this level of support out there too and that they start to feel more comfortable engaging with smaller tech companies, uh, that, that's a great outcome. And, and on that note, I wanted, so we have, uh, we, we, when we thought about it, so we wanted to do that. And the second was we wanted to give people an opportunity to apply for any of our open positions at LogDNA. And, um, and, and we looked at that. <laughs> and so, you know, our hiring plans, so they're like 15. It's not going to make like, like it's not going to make a massive impact that's going to change the world. So, so we're also fortunate in, in, in promoting the event to be joined by a number of sponsors who we also felt stood for the same principles that we stand for. And so, so I wanted to just give a special thanks to, uh, to Sauce Labs, to Sysdig, uh, to Portworks, uh, to Packet and to CloudBees who have all um, participated in this event and promoting this event with us. And for all the attendees, you know, should you be interested in applying, you have like a, essentially a select look at all the opportunities in all of those companies. And all those companies have guaranteed a first interview with the HR department or the hiring manager to make sure that you know that those are places that are safe and that you know that those are, that you'll have a, a fair shot. And so that was, those are the, that was the twofold principle. If, if uh, there'll be a follow-up that everyone will get on like a survey to, to, to basically say, did you enjoy the conversation? Was it helpful or not? What I would love to know though, is as, as I, as I can't define how to show up, I can only receive feedback on how, on the attempt I made. <laughs> Was it was this helpful? And if it's helpful, we would we'll do more of these. We'll do them. You know, Alexis, you don't have to be on every one. <laughs> We'd love to have you back. <laughs> but, um, but we can we yeah, yeah we'll have you. Uh, we can we we can broaden it out. We can also broaden the network of companies that stand for this too, and potentially cycle it around through different companies as sponsors. And so, so if we can create a community uh, of these small companies, you know, these companies that range from a hundred to you know three hundred employees. But if we can be stronger together and create a community together, that's that's one of the things that we'd like to do. So I would love to get people's feedback on whether or not that would be helpful. And if it is, we'll do it. And if it's not, then we won't. And we'll find something else to do that will be helpful. So so just wanted to say thank you to the sponsors. Um, I also just thank you, Alexis. I know you're uh, you know in Paris or somewhere somewhere <laughs> somewhere yes. now with a lot going yeah. on. So so appreciate you taking time uh, take time away to do that. Um, Ingrid, thank you for holding me accountable always and and all the guidance you give. 
Um, I have to give a special thanks to Lise Jones, who has been on the Log DNA side and helped coordinate the whole thing and, mm-hmm. and talked me through the process of doing my first Instagram video yesterday too, which was wow. An example of me being uncomfortable. Yeah, uh, <laughs> uh, and, then, and then finally, just thank everyone who, who joined today. Uh, I, you know, I, I appreciate people taking time out of their schedules. Uh, I think the last thing that anyone's looking for right now is another Zoom call, uh, but it is an important topic. And so I'm, I'm, I'm super proud of the fact that we've got, I think at one point we had up to 120 attendees. Um, so they're just really glad that, 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 that hopefully we're having some measurable impact on the world. So thank you all. Oh, I mean, thank you for having us, Tucker and, and Ingrid. Thank you for for joining us, for educating us, for educating Tucker. Um, give us, I mean, give us a takeaway. I don't want to, I mean, put you on the spot here, but uh, I do think there are a lot of reasons to be optimistic, and I think we need to hold on to those reasons to be optimistic these days more than ever. So, so what does the next decade uh, of DEI look like? in the tech industry and um, and what can we do to continue to follow you and your work? Okay. So, I mean, I think, uh, you know, we live in a world of AI and smart devices and um, augmented humans and uh, chat bots. And, you know, we take the humans out of, um, out of the world when we do that, right? When, when, when we bring all of that into our world, it makes us work smarter and faster. But, you know, I think the, the principles of diversity, equity, inclusion, belonging are really salient to humanity, right? And they make us better, right? Like if we're always considering someone else, if we're always building empathy for someone else, we can't help but win. I, ultimately, I know that sounds kind of sappy, but it's the truth, right? Like, it's how I approach my leadership from an empathetic standpoint. And mm-hmm. holding companies accountable to that empathy is exactly who I am and what I love to do. You can find me at ilhpossibilities.com. And if you need to contact me directly, it's, in, uh, I'm sorry, ilhpossibilities at gmail.com. And I'm Ingrid Lawrence on Instagram. Awesome. Well, you got you got a new follower now. I'm gonna follow you, and I think and apparently Tucker is an Instagram pro now. So yeah, I know it's a big deal. It's kind of, it's kind of a big deal, Alexis. You might want to you might want to look me up. <laughs> I'll follow you too, Tucker. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, wow, I got I got another yeah. certified following me. I'm feeling good now. <laughs> it's happening. It's happening. <laughs> I'm, I'm pulling it up right now. Um, and then I mean, and thank you to all of you. Um, I I know. I mean, uh, like, like you heard, you know, we, we're in a world of lots of Zoom calls. And so doing yet another, um, I know, is not uh, not necessarily the most, you know, riveting thing. But I mean, it, it's just great to see all the attention, all the focus on this important issue. And we're going to make all this content available after the fact. So even if you couldn't watch it live or if you want to send it to someone who missed it, you'll be able to. Um, but this is something, you know, I really, I... I plan on spending however many working years I have left uh, making this a big part of all the work that I do going forward. Um, Whether it's for profit or not for profit, um, I really want this to be a big part of my legacy. And I do think that um, there's no shortage of work to be done. And, uh, and it's, uh, it's just, I'm grateful to, to, to like um, just, get to hear and see all of this and for you all to give me way more credit than I deserve for uh, a little thing that I did. Um, but, uh, it does make me feel good. So there's that. I appreciate that. Um, but, uh, I, I think these are the kind of conversations we need now more than ever, especially in an industry like tech that has such an opportunity to create upward mobility and such an opportunity to create, amazing outcomes for people. It, it materially changed the trajectory of, of my life. And I know it can change the trajectory of so many lives if we create that environment, if we make it not just an environment where the goal is equality, but but equity and, and beyond. Um, so grateful that all of you tuned in. Thank you again. Um, Tucker, Ingrid, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, thanks to all the sponsors and everyone else. Appreciate you. Thank you all. Take care. Have a great rest of your day. All right. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye. Ciao.